Chapter 1 Invisible Battlegrounds Defined I remember being six years of age and ushered into an external and internal war zone without the proper tools needed to skillfully navigate through the constant twists and turns. By that time, my mother had suffered an extremely traumatic accident causing severe and permanent brain damage, and my father was an alcoholic who could not properly care for my sister and I. Although it was quite clear to me, and I couldn't understand it at the time, I can now look back in reflection and properly articulate the outline and complete structure of Hell's assignment against my life and the invisible battleground I was standing directly in the centre of and didn't have a clue. Because I didn't have a spiritual foundation or insight, it was impossible for me to engage in warfare and dismantle the enemy seeking to destroy me. When you think of a battleground, it's quite normal to imagine soldiers in combat. On opposite sides of a field are enemies at war against each other, both vigorously pursuing the same goal, victory. In war, the battlegrounds, also known as combat zones, are marked territories set aside for strictly that purpose, war. When it's time for matters to be settled, both sides would gather and head to the battlegrounds to duke it out and fairly determine who will walk away with the winning title. One thing you'll notice is that everyone involved in these types of battles are of age and have personally consented. Another example of a battleground is found on our map in the United States. We have what are called battleground states, also known as swing states. What this means is that during elections and competitive rallies, the two major political parties have a strong and fair shot at claiming the winner's seat because they each have like amounts of support among the people. Again, those who are able to participate in the electoral process are those who are of age and have been given permission to cast their vote for whichever side they stand on. The reason this is relevant enough to point out is because it highlights just how strong both sides coming into battle are. What it also shows us is just how divided the people are. Now, not all states are battleground states, so in as many places during political rallies, one side has the upper hand by a landslide, and the other doesn't have a shot at winning at all. In those types of matches, it's usually quite clear from the beginning who will win in the end. This is mostly because the people are more unified in their beliefs, and there are more of them than there are of those against them. Sometimes it all comes down to who you have on your team and standing in your corner. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 11 says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favour to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. This scripture is befitting for both the natural and spiritual. See, the length of a battle is not always easily predictable. Some can be pretty short, while others, well, others can last for quite some time. In the scenarios given, I want you to picture that each team starts out fully equipped, fully staffed and ready for battle. Somewhere in between the beginning and the middle of the battle, though, you'll imagine that there are fewer and fewer soldiers on the battleground. Some falling victim to their opponent amid the battle draw their last breath, having their remains removed from the grounds. And then there are the others, who willfully relinquish their active duty status and give up as they decidedly bow to their temporary physical state and walk off the battleground, while their cohorts are still fighting. By the end of the battle, the number of soldiers left do not at all mirror the amount when both sides started, and well, the few who remain are determined, they're going to fight to the finish. In the natural and in the spirit, the battle is always won by those who remain in the fight, until the end. Much like these natural, visible battlegrounds, The invisible battlegrounds I want to unfold in the upcoming pages are those designated areas in our lives where battles take place, in our minds, our flesh, and in our spirits. There are spiritual forces at work above us, around us, beneath us, and within us at all times. It's important that we not only understand these forces, but that we also determine which side we're on so that we can suit up and fight back. In order to fight back, we need to be armed with the proper equipment that will ensure that the victory is ours. See, the thing about warring in the spirit is that we have help. 
Christ himself is standing in our corner. With Christ on our team, losing is not our portion. Romans chapter 8 verse 31 says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That alone tells us that it doesn't matter how large our opponent is or how outnumbered we may be. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 57 says, But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We won from the beginning. Jesus secured the victory and handed it to us upon his death on the cross. The reason I found it important enough to point out the fact that in both examples given, in each scenario, all participants are of age, is because it's important to note that hell does not always play fair. Satan launches attacks against children primarily because of their inability to fight back, and because he is aware of their future, in a lot of cases long before they are. If he can ensnare them while they're young, there's a good chance that he'll have them for life. The purpose of this book is to uncover and expose the snares of Satan, making more and more believers aware of his strategies, schematic plots, and twists, so that they can see him coming and send him on his way. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, to keep Satan from taking advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. What good is having the victory in Christ and not knowing it, or knowing it but being without the proper fortitude to wield it successfully? So you have victory, but if you can't access it, what good is it to you? Most believers are familiar with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You, my fellow believer, are on the battleground. Your life depends on your ability to remove the blindfolds and plainly see for yourself the forces at work against you. You are in a very real, intense, invisible war for your soul. In this battle, you need to focus, because it's either kill or be killed. It's time for you to learn how to use your weapons so you can win every war. A fight is what Satan wants, and a fight is what he will get. No longer will we passively sit by and watch him run rampant through the pages of our lives. Why? Because we're being made aware of his tactics and are getting ourselves equipped to beat him at his own game. We're not fighting for the victory. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 teaches us, In this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. When we learn this, we also understand that we are fighting from a place of victory. Before we go any further, I want to lay out and make clear the intentions of Satan. He uses the same tactics in all areas, mind, flesh and spirit. His tactics are the same. His approach and his techniques are what vary. He goes to great lengths to take us off course and use our hands to fulfill his missions. However, there is absolutely nothing he can do in the life of a Christian without God's permission. We learn this from the life of Job. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Job chapter 1 verses 7 to 12. We see here that the enemy takes the time to survey the land searching for his next prey. And at times, God will cut his search short and give him exactly what it is he's looking for, but with clear-cut boundaries. It's safe to say that sometimes we are entered into battle, not because the enemy sought us out, 
but because God volunteered us. Even still, with all of Satan's desires, strategies, intentions and attempts, God remains the one in control. And as long as we belong to him, the enemy of our souls will never have the last say. Let's explore six of his intentions and the scriptures that fortify us against them. 1. Satan distorts your view of God, the Father. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command angels and his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 to 11. We know that the enemy's goal is to kill, steal, and destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. What many of us do not know is that one of his main strategies for doing so is by causing us to think, perceive, and believe things about God that simply aren't true. As the father of lies, it's Satan's absolute pleasure to distort our view of God so that we can never fully know him, embrace him, or experience the depths of his love and plan for us. This is so important because once Satan is successful at distorting what we believe about God, he doesn't have to do much more to keep us separated from him and the totality of the relationship he desires to have with us as his children. When we are unable to see him as a loving, kind and generous father, it makes it extremely difficult to receive his love, kindness and generosity. Neil T. Anderson, author of Victory Over the Darkness, writes, The major strategy of Satan is to distort the character of God and the truth of who we are. He can't change God, and he can't do anything to change our identity and position in Christ. If, however, he can get us to believe a lie, we will live as though our identity in Christ isn't true. See, these misconceptions about God, birthed in us through various types of experiences, rob us of our ability to truly love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. Luke chapter 10 verse 27. Although we know that God can never be totally understood by the human mind, the enemy's priority is to kill any part of us that would be willing to commit to a lifestyle of trying. John chapter 8 verse 44 tells us, You belong to your father. The devil and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. This verse from God's Word, the Bible, puts everything into proper perspective, doesn't it? Because lying is his native language, you can expect that literally everything the devil says is untrue. The only truth he can speak is the Word of God. However, When he quotes the word of God to you, you can expect that his motive is to get you to completely misinterpret or misunderstand its meaning. Once that happens, it's so easy for you to miss what God is saying and never receive the promises of the scriptures. As believers, it's so important that Satan does not know the word of God better than we do, and even more important, that we can discern his voice from our own and from the voice of our Father. Psalm 